morning, church. Let's stand and sing together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all my sea is a mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every day now, lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Tread. 
treasure for the traitor. No ear is heard, no eye is seen. The image of the Father until heaven came to live with me. A rescue like no Father, we thank you for a place that we can come and gather and worship and celebrate who you are, celebrate your presence, celebrate your love and your mercy. God, as we worship this morning, I pray that you are glorified in each one of our hearts. God, help to position our hearts and our minds so that we can be receptive of your word this morning, be receptive of your love, and understand that you are worthy today. We thank you for this place. We lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. So you guys can have a seat. I think we have a, a brief video for you guys real quick. Thanks. Have a good night. Tutorial, that we don't need to do singing lessons like that or gymnastics or any dance lessons. Yeah. It's just expensive, you know, and I don't oh, even want no. to. No, 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 no. Hey, please, please. Sorry, we closed already. Come back tomorrow. No, no, but tomorrow's Mother's Day. Hey, 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 hey. I have cash. Let's make it snappy, boys. I got some hungry kitties to get home to. I don't know why you want to buy your wife something that's just going to be dead in three days. It's a thank you for all the slack she picks up with our family. I mean, you and I both know I'm a mediocre dad and husband at best. Hey, listen up here, me amigo. Buying your wife a bowl of petunias is not going to assuage your sins for being an extremely subpar father and husband. I didn't say extremely subpar. You didn't have to. <laughs> you know, Mother's Day gifts, they just seem so desperate. I mean, take me for example. I gave my wife, Victoria, the best gift that she will ever have. A diamond? My offspring. What woman wouldn't want that? <laughs> Here we go. Just let that sink in. The truth will set you free. All right, OK. All the phones. Is there like eucalyptus in here? Is that eucalyptus or is that a cat? Ugh. Uh, how much is this? Uh, 175, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Told you, 175 bucks a dead by Wednesday. Hey, la macaroon. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> okay, that's gonna leave a mark. Ugh. Hey, hold your gifts, let me go. Couple, thank you. Let's home for the missus. Attention, everybody. That's not eucalyptus. That is a bona fide cat. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this before he destroys the place. Uh, is this your shop? Uh, no, it's my mom's place. She opened it when we were kids. So I guess you didn't get her flowers for Mother's Day. <laughs> Actually, every Mother's Day, she would let each of us kids go through the shop and pick out something to give her. We'd all pick out the biggest, most expensive things we could find. <laughs> so I... So I, uh, I, I guess... I guess she bought her own gifts? Oh, she paid for her flowers and much more. She paid with long days and short nights, replacing her worries with prayer. She gave up what she needed so that we could have what we wanted. She gave up more than I'll ever really know. But she didn't look at it that way. She would say, you all are my true little flowers, and it's my job to make sure that you are watered with love and placed in the light of the sun. I mean, that's what moms do, right? They help us grow in God's love so that we can be a witness to God in the world. So I thank God for her daily and Nowadays, I sneak cash in the register and I pay for her flowers on Mother's Day. Receipt. Can you put these in the tab, please? Door, 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 door. Here, I just. Okay, I'm holding it with my foot. I am towing the door. Oh, I got it, I got it. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, boy. Happy Mother's Day, moms, definitely, and that, and as we know, our nation, this is the day that we've set aside uh, to show our appreciation for our moms and all they do for us, and, uh, you know, when we think of our moms and we think uh, uh, about them and we set that time aside, there's certain things we know that uh, just come along with motherhood, and there's certain things like, like sayings that come along. If you, I mean, if you research and you go online and you take a look, there's all these different sayings that we get used to hearing moms say. I mean, list after list, it was actually too long for me to go over here, but, you know, there's some common ones that, that maybe maybe you've heard your mom say before. Like, I don't know, did you ever hear your mom say, if you keep making those faces, your face will freeze like that forever or anything like that? Or, or probably all of us can relate to the most common answer given by a mom when we ask the question, why is because... 
That, see, we all had different moms, and we all heard the exact, it's like, they're, it's like they're schooled. Whenever asked why, just because I said so. That's good enough, and we have to agree with that. And so there's, there's, you know, there's sayings after sayings after sayings that we're, we're used to hearing from mom. We all could agree on because, like I said, our moms, you know, we, we've heard that. But, but as I was going through this and preparing this and, and that this week, I also came across uh, a, a list of things that we probably wouldn't hear our mom say. Or it would be highly unusual for us to hear these words spoken by our moms. For example... Could you ever imagine your mom saying this? How on earth can you see the TV sitting so far back? Scoot right up close in front so you can get a better view of that. Would you ever hear your mom say that? Or how about, yeah, I used to skip school a lot too. Not a problem. You know, or just leave all the lights on. It makes the house look so much cheerier that way. Or go ahead, keep that stray dog, honey. I would love to feed it and care for it and walk it every single day uh, of its life. Or, Or, well, hey, if that's good enough for Tommy's mom or Tammy's mom, then that's good enough for me. Not a problem. Or the curfew. It's just a general time to shoot for, honey. I, it's not like I'm running a prison around here or anything. Or I, I don't have a tissue with me. I'm sorry. Just use your sleeve or blow your nose on your sister or brother's sleeve. You know, that'd be better. Or my favorite, oh dear, don't bother about wearing a jacket. The wind chill's bound to improve sometime today. You know, I mean, those, when you hear those statements, probably aren't statements that we would connect with our moms. Maybe if you had a sarcastic mom, you might have heard something along those lines of being said. And also, while I was putting this together and thinking, I found out there was a mom test. I didn't even know there was a mom test. I praise God, there's not a dad test, but there was a mom test. And, and, and that in and this one little, this lady was talking about how she was walking with her four-year-old daughter in the park one day, and her four-year-old daughter started, saw something on the ground, picked it up, and started to put it in her mouth, and her mom knocked out of her hand and said, hey, don't put that in your mouth, and her little four-year-old looked at her kind of confused, and was like, why? And she said, because you never know where that had been, or, or they could have some kind of disease, or, or, you know, it's been outside, it could have some germs on it, you want to stick those germs in your mouth. And at this point, she said her daughter looked at her with this admiration and asked, how do you know these things? And she was trying to think real, real quick like, and she said, well, it's on the mommy test. Daughter said, mommy test? Yeah, the mommy test. All moms have to take the and pass the test before they can become a mom. And she's like, oh, and they started to walk along. And she could tell her four-year-old daughter was kind of mulling everything she just heard over in her head until all of a sudden she stopped. She says, oh, I get it. So if you fail the mommy test, you become a daddy, right? And she said, that's absolutely right. And they walked on, had the best day uh, of her life. So as I mentioned, it's a day that's set aside, not because moms had to pass some some type of test or whatever to become moms, but it's because of the things and advice and and, and examples that that we learn from them. again, I also realize that it can be a difficult day. I I understand that. You know, uh, for some of us, we've lost our moms. For some people, they're trying to be a mom and struggling and and having a hard time, you know, uh, and and haven't been able to be a mom. For some moms, they've, they've lost their children. For some, they didn't have the best mom growing up. So I do, but in spite of all that, and I do understand all of that, I still think it's a good idea to have set aside a day to celebrate and give thanks for the moms in our lives, because if we're honest, you know, if we hadn't had a mom, none of us would be here today, right? And, and, and so there's things that I think we can learn from our moms. You know, they constantly give of their time, their abilities, their money, their love, their lives. And yes, I know there are exceptions, but most mothers live lives of ongoing sacrifice for their children. You know, typically, you know, in moms, we see that where it's like, you know, you wonder why sometimes. It's like Reader Digest was talking about uh, a young lady named Aura Justice. They wrote an article on her for things that she had done. And, and, and Aura, she was a mother of four, and she was getting, coming to the end of an extremely busy week, long and busy week, and at the end of an extremely long and busy day when her oldest 17-year-old daughter looked at her and said, Mom, why did you even have kids? And Aura said she looked at her daughter and said, I could never imagine my life without them. To which her daughter replied, but mom, 
you don't have a life. <laughs> and sometimes sacrificially, I'm sure moms can feel that way, that you know, they don't have their life because their life is, is all about giving and embodies the essence of sacrifice, of, uh, of putting everything out there for those that they love so much. And normally it's done a little at a time in small deeds of service and love, but there are occasions when it happens all at once. But you know, moms, they have that blessing, they have that life and they give some great advice to us. They really do. You know, all joking aside, as I started out there with, with the different jokes about what we hear moms say and stuff like that, there, there was one mom, pretty famous mom. Uh, well, most people know her, whether they go to church, read the Bible or not. You know, that's, that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she gave some advice that not only was it applicable back then when she said those words, that I think it is still extremely applicable to us today. And not just in what she was talking about, but in every area and every aspect of our life. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, his mother, talking about Jesus' mother, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Now, this is at the wedding in Canaan of Galilee. And they had run out of wine. And so everybody's panicking and they come to Mary and they're talking to Mary. And Mary says, go to Jesus, go to my son, and do whatever he tells you. And of course, we know in that story, he ends up turning the water into wine and stuff like that because that's what he told them to do when it comes to that aspect. But those words that she spoke, do whatever he tells you, is such great advice for us in our life. You know, when we take a look at our life. And it's one thing here at WCC, we're always trying to encourage, we're trying to challenge, we're trying to treat, teach, we're trying to learn together about what is it that Christ did then? How is it that he lived? What are the things he said and, 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 and you know, and, and what are the things and how did he live his life? Because when we take a look at the life of Christ, when we take a look at the words of Christ, when we take a look at the teachings of Christ, you know, the very sacrifice and, and, and generous life and loving life to give, that's what the whole message of the Bible is all about. It's about this loving, generous sacrifice, about how God has been willing to give so much to us. I mean, what's the most famous verse that we find within Scripture? The most famous verse you see plastered at sporting events and everything. They teach at Sunday schools and VBSs. That's out there. John 3.16. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The very beginning there, for God so loved that he gave, you know, and again, in direct relationship, you see, you notice a direct relationship between love and sacrifice. And if we really let love lead our lives, if we really understand that kind of love that is there, then it will lead us to a life of generosity. It will lead us to a life a sacrificial way of living our life. There's another verse that Paul, when he was trying to teach the Corinthians and trying to help them understand, you know, what God has done for them through his son, Jesus Christ, and the example that Jesus has set for them and, and the beauty and the blessing that's been demonstrated uh, uh, in the life of Christ, he says in, in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, these words, for you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And I love the Phillips translation uh, uh, of that verse that begins this way. Remember the generosity, the generosity of Jesus Christ. Because the life of Jesus was a life of giving generously. It was a life of sacrifice. And it's a life that calls each and every one of us to live the exact same way. Because see, I think sometimes we forget, and I don't know if we take time, you know I'm really big on asking questions and evaluation questions and all of that, but let me ask you this, have you ever thought about what happens when you and I, when we learn how to live generously, when we learn how to give sacrificially? I mean, just pause and think about that for a second. What does that do in our walk, in our relationship with God? I mean, first and foremost, it makes us more like him, does it not? I mean, that famous verse I said, we read at the very beginning, you know, uh, for God so loved that he gave. He is a generous, loving God. So when we learn to be generous and love and give the way he is, it makes us more like him. But it also strengthens our faith because to give generously, 
or to give sacrificially, that can be difficult. All of us, you know, well, we're going to talk about that, this in a few minutes. It, it's a struggle that we have to answer some questions. And so, you know, to give generously and sacrificially means we're going to have to lean more on God, lean more on His understanding and realize that, okay, does God really provide all I need? you know, according to his riches in glory. And when we say yes, and we start to give that way, we start to live that way, we start to love that way, all of a sudden we see God starting to show up in our life in ways that he promises because we're living the life he asked us to. And so he fulfills the promises that he's given to us. And all of a sudden we see him show up, which means our faith in God increases because we see God working in our life. And it brings God's blessing upon our lives, like I said. And it results in a life of happiness and joy. You can kind of see the picture that's starting to be painted for us. A life of living generously and sacrificially giving leads to a life full of joy, full of happiness, full of blessings. And having said all of that, I think we still need to try to figure out and define and understand this whole idea of sacrifice more clearly. Because I think we hear the word. I think, you know, sometimes we believe in our hearts yeah, it needs to be done. Yeah, there's no doubt that we need to be generous with our life. There's no doubt that we need to love. There's no doubt that we need to be, you know, giving sacrificially of all that we have that God's giving there. You know, it's just sometimes when you hear that, I'm not, it's one thing to hear, but are we hearing exactly what he's asking of us and understanding what he wants us to do when the words are spoken? It's kind of like a uh, little story you heard about six-year-old boy getting ready for church, getting ready actually for Sunday school. He comes walking out of his mom and dad's room, and he's got all of his dad's ties in his hands. And his mom kind of looks at him with this weird look, and she said, honey, what are you doing? Why do you have all of daddy's ties? He's like, because mom, the pastor told us to bring our tithes and offerings to the church, you know, and, and so he had the right heart. He was giving all of his tithes. He was bringing all that he had to the church. He just didn't understand the difference between tithes and tithes. So sometimes we hear a pastor, we hear watching a video or being in a Bible study, or we hear, hey, we're called to live a life of generosity. We're called to live a life of sacrifice. We're called to, to love the way that Christ loved. And we hear those words, but I'm not sure when it comes down to understanding how or what that looks like. Sometimes I think we struggle with that. And when you hear me talk about sacrifice, this is, this is simply what sacrifice means when we see it in the scripture and what's asked of us. Sacrifice is about giving up something we love for something or someone we love more. That's simply what sacrifice and this generosity that we're talking, when we love that way, what we're saying. It's about giving up something we love for something or someone that we love more. Proverbs 3.9 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your crops. In other words, we honor God with all that we own. We give him the first and the best of all that we have. And when that's happening, when that's lived out, when we're doing that, that translates into living sacrificially. There's a gentleman named Larry Kaiser, <clears throat> and he wrote this uh, in response and today and, and some of the struggles that we see in understanding this. He said, the joy of sacrificial giving to the Lord's work is one value easily lost in the presence of prosperity. He said, I regularly saw my parents give beyond what was comfortable for them. I don't know how frequently my children see me give sacrificially to God's kingdom with my time, with my talents, with my gifts, with my money, with my offerings. The Bible tells us to honor the Lord with our substance. We normally give to God from our surplus, but he desires our substance, and there is a huge difference. And again, like I said earlier, it's something that we at WCC, that, that we hope we try to encourage, we try to challenge, we try to teach, you know, and, and, and we do that, like I said, I'm, I'm big on evaluations about asking questions, you know, questions that I believe will help us, you know, uh, see where we are in our walk and in our life, in our journey of our faith with God. I mean, questions like this, am I really committed to the ministry and outreach that God has called me to? Am I really committed to the ministry and outreach of the family of God that I belong to? Do I believe that God is here working in our midst, that he's leading and guiding through this process? 
See, we kind of put on pause. I started three weeks ago. I started a series called These Warning Lights and everything. And because today's being Mom's Day, I kind of took a little bit of a different turn here. And we're going to catch up the next two weeks on this. But that's why I'm doing this series right after Easter. We celebrated Easter and the joy of Easter and, and talking about, I mean, Easter Day is what Christianity is built upon. If there was no Easter Day, there'd be no Christianity, no church. And we realized that. But we also needed to learn that, that you know, once Christ rose and he went back to heaven, he didn't just leave us on our own. He sent us the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide, lead, and direct our lives, to get us those warning lights when we start to get off path, when those words are about ready to come out of our mouth <laughs> that shouldn't come out of our mouth because there is no love behind it, it's flesh, or when we're ready to type on social media and get that keyboard to fly in on that email or get those thumbs, and you know, however you text, some people are one finger text or some, you know, like that, you know, and when it comes down to it, you know, to, to really have us think, you know, what, what, what's happening, hey, here's this blinking light, here's this warning sign, you shouldn't say that, or what you're saying, or the way you're acting, that's not, so yes, God is still there, and so we're taking a look and seeing, do I see those? And if I see those warning lights, do I pay attention and do something about them. So asking yourself that, does God really have control in my heart and my life? Do I really desire to honor God and give him the first and the best of all? Do I give out of my surplus or do I give out of my substance? Am I willing to give up something or some things that I love for something or someone that I love more? And for some of us, those questions, we can ask them and they're easily answered. It's not a problem you know, and, and, you know, we quickly respond to them, and there's joy and enthusiasm and excitement um, as we answer that. But for others, there's a struggle. For others, they struggle with because, you know, the, there isn't so much the joy, the enthusiasm, and the excitement because there's this spiritual struggle. There's this inner turmoil, this, 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 this skepticism, this doubt. And again, Everybody, I think, at different times in different ways, they go through this. You know, we struggle because we're still trying to sort out a basic issue. Who's in charge of my stuff? <laughs> Who's in charge of my stuff, me or God? You know, who really is in charge? And that's, that's just a basic fundamental question, but it's a question we struggle with. Again, I talked about moms and examples of moms and stuff like that. I hear stories when I talk, and I've talked to some of you that, you know, you see mom that would, you know, sacrificially give, you know, and, and the ways that they would give. And I hear people talk about, you know, how moms would make that sacrifice. They'd cook a meal and stuff like that. And who is usually the last one to eat? Mom. Unless it's Mother's Day today, you know, hey, mom, it's Mother's Day. You go first. <laughs> Try that tomorrow. Watch her faint. Okay. You know, but I mean, you know, so you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we, we see all these signs and we see all of this, you know, and, and we have modeled for us by our moms, you know, that, that, hey, you know, this, this is here and hey, mom, can I use that? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, mom, can I? Yeah. Who, you know, who owns it? Mom or me? I mean, you know, but what I'm trying to bring that into spiritually is who's in charge of everything I have in my life? Who owns it? Is it really me or is it God? You know, it's something every Christian struggles with in their personal life. And when it comes to our personal life, we talk, we try to learn, we talk about it several times, but we talk about it because it is a struggle that, you know, we're working every day or we should be working every day to realize and remember that all we have is because of God. So we owe everything to him. We realize, we need to realize he's the one who's given us the ability to do what we do. And using the ability is what allows us to have the things that we have. So everything that we have is God's, you know? And when it comes to the church, you know, it's true. Who's in charge, me or God? And it's an unpopular question to ask in a church because we don't like to hear the answer, but you might be sitting there thinking, well, that's a no-brainer. You know, if that's the only question on the test, it's an easy A for me. Who's in charge of the church, me or God? God, duh, you know? But it's something that we struggle with. Because if God's truly in charge of the church, who's the church? The people. See, when I ask that question, who's in charge of the church, the first thing we think of is the building. Well, who's in charge of the church building? Well, you know, no, who's in charge of the church? The church is the people. Who's in charge of the church? People. God. So what does that mean for us? See, it, it's, that, that's why I say we don't like that answer because I just left that answer. Who's in charge of my stuff, me or God? <laughs> God. Who's in charge of the church, which is me? God. So who's in charge of everything? Help me out here, people. 
Okay, that's good. That's a good public confession. We'll just leave it at that right there. I know those of you at home watching online, you yell it out God as well when it comes to that. But, but it's something we struggle with. And we talk about here, you know, I, I try to teach, you know, the love of God. You've heard me talk about that before. We have to look and see how God gives generously and lovingly. How, and we've talked and I've given you specific things we need to be doing to put this love into action between brothers and sisters in Christ, between people we know and don't know, between people we love and we don't love. But how do we give sacrificially to God when it comes to being the church? When it comes to being the church, we have to surrender to him and realize like everything else, you know, this is his. We are his and not ours. I think one of the greatest testimonies to this is when Paul again was was teaching those in Corinth and he was given an example of the Macedonians he was talking financially how they dug deep and gave way beyond anything that they could afford to give financially but he gave a reason at the end that I want you to hear he gave a reason at the end why they were able to 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 give the way that they give he gave a financial illustration but this is applicable in all of our lives and this is what he said about the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8 1 to 5 and now brothers We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints, and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. That phrase that I have in, you know, underlined there, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. What's Paul talking about? See, he's talking about the central foundational core issue of the Christian life. He's talking about uh, the one thing that empowers our faith and our spiritual life, the one thing that makes real and lasting change possible in our lives. The one thing that makes it possible for us to live generously and to hold on loosely to those things within our life. He's talking about dying to self and fully yielding our hearts and our, our, our lives and our time and our abilities and our, our potential and our wealth to the authority and to the rule of the one we call Jesus Christ. You see, giving ourselves to Jesus is kind of a matter of doing the same thing that Jesus did when he gave himself to us. Metaphorically speaking, it's a matter of getting on the cross and dying to self, getting myself out of the way, getting myself out of the way. See, I said at the beginning of this message that mothers, and I brought it up a couple times, can be great examples of this for us in our lives, of how they are willing to give sacrificially, even their life. And and, and I'm always reminded of a, a very, very powerful story told by Solomon Roseberg. You may have heard it before because it is so popular. I think it was several years ago I actually shared it again on, on Mother's Day. But I think it's such a, a beautiful illustration of this whole sacrificial life of giving and surrendering that we're trying to talk about here today that Paul said this is why the Macedonians could be this way because they first gave themselves to God and and what that means to live that life. Uh, Solomon Roseberg and his wife and their two sons and, and then his mother and father were arrested and they were placed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a labor camp and the rules were extremely simple. You worked, you lived. You didn't work, you died. Those were the rules at the concentration camp. And Roseberg said that as they were there, as the time went on, he watched his mother and father as they worked and they labored, get more tired and more weak, finally not come home in the evenings. And, and he knew he would never see him again. And his greatest fear was his youngest son, David, was extremely weak. So every night he would come home after his hard day of labor and, and he would look for those familiar faces and he would see his wife and his two boys and they would huddle together and praise God and give thanks for another day of life. But one evening he came home and he did not see the familiar faces until he found his oldest son, Josh, in a corner crying and, and praying. And he said, Josh, please tell me it's not true. And he says, oh, Papa, it's true. Today, David was too weak and too tired. So they came to get him and to take him away. And he said, well, where's your mom? And he says, oh, Papa, Mom saw that David was terrified, so she walked up and took his hand and said, come on, son, it's going to be okay, come with me, and she went with him. And I know how saddening, and that pulls at the heartstrings and everything, but to me, 
I think that is such, in, in our human life, such a beautiful picture of sacrificial giving and what a beautiful reminder it is for what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's gone to the cross. He's given his life so we don't have to fear death. He's gone to the cross and now he simply stands at the door and says, hey, you have nothing to fear. Just take my hand and come with me. Just take my hand and come with me and let's get rid of that old self and let's become that new self that I created you to be within your life. You see, if you're finding yourself today thinking your life is dull, empty, maybe filled with tension, indecisiveness, you're struggling, you know, in conflict, then maybe God has just brought you here or had you tune in online. So maybe you could just be reminded and take some time and ask yourself, have I done what the Macedonians have done? So I could give or whatever God's asking me to give the way that they give? Have I surrendered and given myself completely to the Lord? That's what I want us to ask ourselves as we're going to be coming before these emblems here this morning, as the worship team is going to be continuing to allow us to worship this God that has given and is a giving God, a sacrificial giving God that gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes shall not perish, but has that kind of love for us and that desire for us in our lives. So we can say what Paul said, not a theological announcement when he was talking to the Galatians, but we can give the same beautiful testimony that Paul gave when he penned these words to the Galatians in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Because you see, if you and I, like the Macedonian believers, have truly given ourselves to the Lord, then there's what they call this co-crucifixion that goes on. We've been crucified with Christ, and we've been united with Him in His death. And as a result of that death to self, the reins of control have been handed over to Christ. We're no longer in the driver's seat. You know, I no longer live. You no longer live. We no longer live, but Christ lives in us. So maybe as we come before these elements, and I always encourage you to do and challenge you to do as you take the two cups and go back to your seat and to remember the sacrifice of a giving, loving God that was there, how he gave his son and what that means for us in his life and give praise for that. Also let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And, and maybe during this time, maybe for some of us, the really important question is not, okay, how much do I have to give of my, or how much of my, my time, talent, finances, and energy do I need to give? Maybe a much better question is this. Have I really honestly given myself to the Lord? 100% that I can say, who's in charge of my stuff? God. Who's in charge of the church? Because it's me, God. Let's take some time and give thanks because when that question is settled, the other questions come, get answered fairly easily. So let's go before him right now. And let's just let the Holy Spirit speak to our heart. And let us see if a decision needs to be made or whatever that may be, Father, that needs to be within our life here today. Father, thanks. Thanks for this time we could celebrate, we could gather. Thanks for this day we do set aside and, and, and Father, celebrate moms and, and, and what that means to us and the sacrifices that they may. And I pray that it can be a blessed day, Father God, for, for all the moms uh, around, Lord. And, and, but I also thank you that the example that those moms have, Father, is your example of how you gave, how you lovingly and generously and sacrificially gave of your son and what that blessing does mean to us. I thank you for these emblems that you've given us to come and to partake of, to remember that blessing and to celebrate and, and to rejoice and to give thanks for what that means. But also right now, Lord, as we take this time and as we worship, Father God, may your spirit speak to our hearts and help us understand. Help us understand who's in charge. Help us understand, have we totally surrendered? If not, why not today? Father God, that we take that step and we make that step, Father God, so we can live as you have lived, Father. And as Mary said, we can do whatever you tell us to do because, Father, you know what's best for our lives and we praise you so much for that. Thank you, Father, for this time. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
My sorrow in dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested. My life began, and ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life Oh, your grace so free washes all. Your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now, life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, faithful. Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. 
Darkness rejoices though heaven has no Come on, church. But the Jesus arose with the your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us do now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all We're so happy that you guys joined us to worship this morning. As we close, there are just a few things that we want to communicate to you as, as church leaders and as members of a community. And that's part of um, us being a part of a bigger group. So we've made it uh, easy for you to connect with us this week. If you want to go online to wcc.family, that'll lead you to um, just a, a, a hub for all the things that we have going on at the church. There's ways to connect. There's upcoming events. There's information about ministries and ways to get you involved so we want to encourage you to do that part of that being part of a community is uh, like Dave said just living generously and we also want to make it really easy for you guys to, to partner with us in ministry through giving so you can do so this morning at the at the boxes in the back of the room but also online at wcc.family or by pointing your phone at the connect cards uh, with the QR codes throughout the building so as we close let's just go before the Father in prayer God we celebrate you this morning we celebrate what you've done throughout our community, but also in us individually. And as we, as we go this morning, I pray that you can help us to understand that we're part of uh, something bigger than just us, God. We're called to dig a little deeper. So help us to be more like Jesus this week. Help us to see you as a God of mercy and justice and, and peace this week. And help us to understand your presence. We thank you for your love pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for being here this morning. Have a good week.